landscape behind That's you. That's what I think, Miranda. It's like you're in. Lovely. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight, and welcome to this month's Brisbane Literary Mafia Zoomcast. Um, Tonight we'll be hearing from three writers who all have a connection to the Brisbane literary scene. We've got Chrissy Neen, Cass Moriarty and Mirandi Rewo with us tonight. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm currently uh, broadcasting to you from, the Yagara and Turrbal people. I pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, before I hand you over to our speakers tonight, I'd just like to reiterate some of the information that you were sent in the email with the link to this event. So you've all automatically been placed on mute and you'll remain so until the end of the event. Um, well, I'll unmute you all so that you can join me in thanking our speakers. Um, but if you'd like to ask a question before then, then you can do so via the chat box. Um, the question that you, whatever you type in there will come straight to me and I can read your question out along with your name when prompted to do so later in the evening. So please start sending any questions that you have through to me um, from the start and I'll read them all out um, when we have time at the end of the event. So I'd also like to mention that we have a special offer on this evening for event attendees. Um, if you use the code event when placing an order on our website, then you'll receive 10% off within the next 24 hours. So make sure that you get online and take advantage of that offer while it's available. Um, I would now like to introduce our special guest this evening, Mirandi Rewo. Mirandi is the author of the novella, The Fish Girl, which won Seizure's Viva La Novella and was shorted for the Stella, shortlisted sorry, for the Stella Prize and the Queensland Literary Awards UQ Fiction Prize and Stone, Gold, Stone Sky Gold Mountain. Her work has appeared in Best Australian Stories, Mianjin, Review of Australian Fiction, Griffith Review and Best Summer Stories. Mirandi has a PhD in Creative Writing and Literary Studies and she lives in Brisbane. Um, I'll be handing you over to Cass Moriarty now, um, who will continue the introductions for the evening and get the conversation started. Um, Cass also lives and writes in Brisbane. Her novels, The Promised Seed and Parting Words have been shortlisted for many awards. So Cass, I will now let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Emma Kate. And hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is very exciting on our second Brisbane Literary Mafia Zoomcast. Um, last time was so much fun with Bree Lee and tonight we're really excited to be speaking to Mirandi. Um, but before we do that, Chrissy is, is here with us tonight. She, you might remember she was um, ill last month and couldn't make it. She had to watch us from her, actually from her hospital bed. But she's with us tonight, thank goodness. Um, so I want to do a proper introduction to Chrissy because I have a very special announcement to make. So Chrissy Neen is the award-winning author of eight works of fiction, non-fiction and poetry. And we are absolutely thrilled to bits to announce tonight that she is the 2020 recipient of the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund Fellowship for non-fiction. So each year, Cal awards only two fellowships, one for fiction and one for non-fiction. And Chrissy will receive $80,000 to write her book with this body, a book which examines our societal relationship to fatness. With this body will be an exploration of societal pressures for women and female identifying people to conform to particular body expectations and also a celebration of unruly bodies that dare to exist in defiance of societal norms. Chrissy, congratulations. And let's just take a minute to, for you to say what this award means to you. Thank you, Cass. It's, it's incredibly exciting. Um, firstly, uh, it means that um, Brisbane is, um, you know, it's punching above his weight yet again. Mm -hmm. We have um, Brisbane kind of, Brisbane authors, I feel fantastic to be um, representing Brisbane um, on the Australia-wide scene. And it's really, really fantastic um, because it gives me time to work on this book. And this has been a book that has been knocking at the back of my brain for years. And I've been um, a little bit too scared, really, to, um, to actually engage with it. It's been a really difficult subject for me. I mean, anyone else who struggles um, with 
uh, a fat body in this world will know that it's um, one of the things that you just find it really difficult to talk about. And um, so for me, this has been, uh, yeah, it's just been a journey of trying to find a way to force myself to the table to write this book, which I know is important, but which is going to kill me writing it. And so this um, particular opportunity has really allowed me to kind of go, okay, I'm going to really focus on this book. I'm going to have to um, cut down on some of my day job at the coalface, which is a shame, but I'll be back. Um, but it'll give me a chance to actually just focus on this project, which is really great. Well, we are all absolutely, absolutely Yay. so thrilled. Yay! So it was proud. only just announced today. Very, very proud of you, Chrissy. And um, if anyone deserves this award, it is you for sure. You Correct. So much. Everybody, look out for that for that book, um, Chrissy. Yes. Yeah. Let's, let's talk to Mirandi. Let's let's put Mirandi on the hot seat. Hi, Mirandi. Hi, Chrissy. Um, okay. so, We've got you here today because, um, you know, we've just, we've, we've all read your fantastic um, book, um, Stone Sky Gold Mountain, and um, we've read The Fish Girl, and we've read um, your novella in the Griffith Review, and we know that what you do best is to kind of uncover hidden histories, uh, and I really want to know how you do that, because if there's a hidden history, it's not like you can just go to, you know, your... Um, grade 12 tech history textbook and open it up and find out about, um, you know, the Chinese people in the gold rush era. Um, it must be much more complicated than that. So how do you, do you have a time machine and go back and interview people perhaps? That's exactly what I do, Chrissy. <laughs> I thought so. You look like the kind who has a time Yes, machine. that's exactly what I do. Um, no, look, I, I gave this question some thought just before um, because obviously it's, it comes down to research and what you find in your research and anybody who researches knows the sort of deeper you go, the sort of little, you know, wormholes you go into that, that get deeper and deeper. But at, at the very beginning, I would say actually what I started out with was myself and what I wanted to look for, which was the presence, say going back to my earliest books, which are the crime fictions, I was looking for the presence of Asians, I guess, not necessarily Chinese but, or Indonesians, but Asians in that, um, the white world of say the 1800s. So that's sort of where it started research wise. So I guess it sort of started with me and what I was searching for. And then, and then you have to sift through the layers. So it would have started with fiction, finding glimpses of the Orient, you know, that's, you know, as it was referred to then, the glimpses of the Orient in um, like say Dickens or um, Oscar Wilde. And that would have been mostly to do with interior decorating, that sort of thing. Um, to really obscure, then you start finding really obscure um, texts from the time, like really hammy about like Victorian London, like now, you know, and then, and then it'll get into, and I mean, a lot of it's quite racist on our turn, you know, on our terms, like for now, but you know, like, um, like I found a reference to a roadhouse. This is in Victorian London, a roadhouse that had, you know, like highway robbers, blah, 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 and colored girls, you know? So then straight away, you're just like, thing, there's something there. And then you're just sort of like delving deeper from there. And, um, especially I guess it, you know, and then that would have been like looking in at sex work then, you know, and, and forms of slavery. Um, another one was that I came across, um, it was called The Stranger's Home, I think, and it was where all, you know, because there was so much between the British and Asia, there was so much going back and forth. Um, the Stranger's Home was for all the sailors, or all the, so they were from all over Asia, and that, that was somewhere they could stay before they sort of hopped back on their boats, or sometimes they were just left itinerant in, in Britain, you know, so it was sort of like a charitable place. But from there, then I read about, um, you know, in the middle of London, how there were places for Indian nannies, because of course they'd come over with the white families and then be left behind or have to wait for another white family to sort of nanny to go home again. So these are sort of aspects of London you're not thinking about, you know, like these women probably maybe going around in their saris or, you know, men. But anyway, so the, the, the language in those sort of texts is very colourful, you know, like you've got your 
Chinaman with his long moustaches and all that sort of, you know, and the silk robes and like, so it's all very Orientalist, um, but, but at least it places them there. So you're sort of delving there, which is the same with the stone sky gold mountain. Then you, you're just looking for traces in, for me, because, because I can't speak Chinese, would be traces in uh, white, you know, Australian text. And then you're um, sort of moving on from there. Well, yeah. that's really interesting, isn't it, Cass? Like, imagine if you could speak, um, if you could read Chinese and, and um, go back to some of those texts. Yes, not, it would I, be. I wonder whether... Oh, well, that's, that's the other... Like, so I've written down a list of, you know, like what I would research. And then, you know, your next... One of your steps along the way, probably towards the middle, I guess, would be approaching um, academics, which is what I did. I approached an, an academic who uh, is fluent in Cantonese and knows about uh, the history of the Cantonese in Australia and, you know, and that part of China. Um, so she could help me out. So that's your next step is somebody who actually can look at that stuff or has looked at that stuff for you. Yeah. How do you, how do you stop yourself, Mirandi? This is the you know, the question for every writer who does any sort of research, how do you mm. stop yourself from going down into those wormholes of research? Like, how do you know when to stop? I don't think you, you stop. What happens is they, there comes a stage where you've, oh, this might sound a bit arrogant, but, but these little wormholes are very specific. So there comes a stage where you might even hit the end of what you can find out and you've got to just accept that. On the other hand, you might be finding out all these new interesting things. And I think what you don't want to do is put it all in your fiction. So what I do is I just keep copious notes of like ideas for next time. Like, so, you know, like Heloise can go on for 20 books just with like, and we'll put in this thing and that thing that you read and which sound fascinating that you can't cram it all in. So I just keep notes of those fascinating things for another time. Can we use the metaphor of the gold mining and the gold digging and say you're coming to the end of a vein of gold when you go down one wormhole? Yes. Can we use that metaphor now? <laughs> I'll use it from now on, Chrissy. Thank you. <laughs> I'll steal it. <laughs> I, love, I love the fact that you've got these books that have all these little gems and these things like a spider web that all connect together and give you a sense of the time. Do you have to like then put a, um, like a red line through the ones that you've actually um, you know, done. Oh, I've done that one. So I'm not going to use that in another one of the novels or. Definitely. But usually, usually it's in that initial, um, the initial list that I have for a book. Like I'll have one, like even for this gold rush one, you know, and I found other fascinating things that I'd like to look into again in my next novel, which will, which will span 150 years, say 1850 to to, um, you know, like now, um, well, so that's longer, but, um, what I did is then when I found those things, so I just, I just divvied up my research. So then I was like, so I had gold rush notes, I called them. And then I had gold rush two notes. <laughs> so I just, I divvied them up as I go, but what I do in the doc, yeah, in the document, once I use those references, I do, I cross them out. Wow, so I'm not going back to them. That and even, I would even do that with, um, you know, like when I went to, so part of my research was going to Maytown and even when you're taking notes of what, I guess, what animals are there and, you know, what the scenery is like and everything, I, I will also make sure I haven't doubled up on them. Wow, that is so organised. So you've got a whiteboard behind you, Mirandi. Is this, <laughs> your, is this where you put some of your research? You talked about a, a spreadsheet or something. but Yeah, so that one... <laughs> that one was supposed to be, um, I was starting a short story and it was about, oh, it was ages ago and it just never went any further. But this one over here, so over there is the bigger one and it, um, that one's already starting to peg out my next um, novel, which is set in Indonesia pre-World War Two. But originally, say for the Gold Rush novel or one of the other novels, what I do is it would... Um, I don't know if you noticed, but it, it's numbered 1, 2, 32. So they're the chapters. Oh, wow. And then, so what I would do, so what I did with Gold Rush is, what I try to do is um, 
tried to like chapter one was ying chapter two was da 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 because we did it that way in the end it wasn't always like that originally it was sort of um just whoever came next but but then i think with the publisher we worked out that it would be what you know what ying uh liar merriam ying liar merriam and that's what happened and then so i i tried to do a different colors and then i try to fill in those you know um fill in what happens throughout it just so i know where i'm going with the book so it's kind serious of serious um, plotting, Mirandy. Serious plotting, or else um, I like to know where I'm going, or else, or else I think I would be more, um, you know, get writer's block. I'd wonder where I was going next. This way, I know where I'm going. Do you have to be all thirty-two chapters ahead, or do you just do a few chapters ahead? Um, mostly, so I mostly I always know what's happening at the end, so the rest is filled in. Some of it's more filled in than um, others, you know, like the beginning um, chapters. And then maybe it'll be roughly, it'll be roughly filled in. It'll be roughly filled in, but, um, but maybe, yeah, maybe I fill it in more like as I'm coming up to those chapters. Yeah. That's fantastic. So um, were there any particular, were there particular books that um, were of, uh, absolutely essential for your research for Stone Sky Gold Mountain? Stone Sky Gold Mountain. Um, what I found was Trove. Trove was very useful. Um, just for... Can you, tell, can you tell the audience what that is? Yeah, Trove, um, it goes through... So you can put in some keywords and years and it'll go through newspapers from that time because there were just so many newspapers and so many... Um, I think even Maytown itself, which doesn't even exist anymore, but Maytown itself had a had a small gazette or its own newspaper, which um, I think Thea Astley writes about. So I'd say fiction-wise, um, fiction was important to how I approached the novel. Like I looked at how others had approached their novels in the area. Thea Astley had um, It's Raining in Mango. Rose Chemain wrote a uh, novel, The Colour, I think it's called, and she actually has a Chinese, a Chinese character in there. The 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 woman, the British woman, um, falls in love with him, um, and then um, Ruth Park had a book on the Gold Rush. So um, so fiction fiction was important. Nonfiction, I probably um, there were a lot of very cowboyish kind of colonial accounts written closer to back then that I um, looked at and they were very, they were very gung ho and very, you know, guns and um, shooting up the place and digging for gold and um, you know, how they treated the Aboriginal people. Uh, so I did read a lot of them just to get a feel for, for, I guess, attitudes. And and a bit for I guess the hardship you know the hardships of of um, northern Queensland at that time. Um, other books I read were by this man named Lee. Now he was Chinese, went to America, and he wrote a book called The Tong Wars, and set in Sa San Francisco about the actual Tong Wars there between the Tongs, because that was another aspect of the Chinese that they were all in different Tongs and they often fought. Um, which I didn't actually go into in my novel, but it was important to know that the Chinese were kind of divided up to a degree to, to sort of the areas they came from. Um, and what else do I have over there? I looked at Chinese poetry, you know, um, you know, just, to, you know, and then you're looking at um, Chinese poetry and mythology. My father's Chinese. So, you know, you just get, your own feel for the culture, I guess, uh, from that, from him. Um, what else did I have? I mean, there was just so much. I mean, it, yeah. on Foxtel, there was even that show called Warriors. And it was, it was um, about the diggers who came into, the gold rush diggers who came into America. But it was just, and it was such a relief to see that when they, um, I think I'd finished my novel by the time they um, showed it on Foxtel. And I was relieved because actually their, their Chinese diggers looked like how mine were described. So it all, it all sort of worked out well. But, um, oh, and the museums, the museums in Melbourne were very, very helpful. So I guess the most important were probably 
and diaries. There was a diary, you know, there's numerous diaries about those first Chinese, but there was one in particular in the quotes in the front of my book of his journey to Maytown and setting up a shop, um, the museums in Melbourne and actually going to Maytown. I mean, there was just so much. I mean, there's just so much that goes into, I guess, because you want to be as accurate as pos possible in a historical, even though it's fiction, you yeah. still want to be as accurate as possible. So much. And Mirandi, yeah. Mirandi, I think um, you'd probably agree that most writers tend to um, return to the same sorts of themes when they're writing. You know, we all have the, the themes that we like to write about. Yeah. And yours, getting back to the title of tonight, is, is researching hidden histories, and I think particularly of women. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask you what is so attractive to you about that, about finding these hidden stories of women from the past that have been silenced or not been allowed to have a voice and bringing well, them out into the Yeah, into the I, guess, I guess for me, I guess it's a feminist kind of, um, you know, that's what probably inspires me is um, a feminist impetus. Um, and it's like what you said, you know, they've been silenced. So I guess, especially in historical fiction, you're looking, I guess what I've realized too is anything that we do read nonfiction or fiction from that period is already portrayed to us through a certain prism, which is a middle-class white, mostly male prism. Um, so I guess I, I like to, I don't, I don't believe in being prescient about it. Like I still like to have my characters think like they would have maybe thought then, but you know, like say with Heloise, my crime fiction um, courtesan, like she knows, I mean, she, she doesn't, she doesn't, she's not feminist as such, but she realizes she's in a bit of a bind, but also she does read Wollstonecraft and Wollstonecraft was around then like her feminist kind of, work on women being trapped in these you know in you know as wives and in the home I mean there was work out there professing these I these feminist ideas so I just had her reading those ones so you know um so I guess um but mostly it it's just sort of um trying to bring bring sort of the truth back to back to maybe sort of closer to where it might have been for people who weren't middle class white males <laughs> yeah it's fantastic I think um it's an amazing project that you're on with all your different books kind of connecting together in lots of different ways mm. um, I think that there's probably people um listening tonight who might have their own questions as well so if if people do have their own questions for Mirandi if they'd like to just pop it in the chat button um particularly if you're doing some research for your own book um, I know that I'm um, probably going to be hitting, hitting you up for some hints when I write my nonfiction book because it's excellent. It's um, you know, it's there's there's a lot that you can miss. Was there was there a bit of a stress about um, about missing something? Or there's always it's, there's or... always a, that's always the stress, and of course the stress is that you you'll get something wrong as well. Um, luckily, I've just been watching um a workshop by Hannah Kent and and I've also heard um another historical fiction writer talk about it and they you know they say you know at the end of the day we're fiction writers uh we're not historians um but I, I don't know I guess also it's it's also recognizing that some of the historians or histories from the past are already skewed anyway, you know, they're sort of recognising that. But yes, no, sorry, you were asking about missing things. That's always a worry. It's, it's always a worry. Even like say when you're doing your PhD or master's or whatever, you, you're worried because right up to the day you hand in, I mean, it could be the next day you find new information, you know, like it's, it's that's always going to be a worry. And I guess you can only just work with what you can work with. But, but but with each of my novels, there's been, I mean, we're talking at least a year or two of solid research before, before I get started. But I know other historical writers sometimes, like I think Tony, Tony, um, no, Tony, your friend. She, she, 
she says that um, Jordan. Tony, Tony Jordan. Jordan, she uh, writes a novel and then does the research later, you know, to, to just check on things or to fill it in later. So some people do it that way. I certainly, um, mine's definitely, um, I do a year or two of, in, before I can even start writing, before I can find my way in, you know. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah, that is some commitment there, I reckon. Yeah, that's what I'm struggling through now at the moment. Because you do, you, you, you know, like I'm still at that stage with the Indonesian one that um, I feel like I couldn't start because I, I don't have enough on board. Mm -hmm. So with, St with Stone Sky, Gold Mountain, Mirandi, what do you think, I mean, it's been out for a little while now, the response has been really great. What do you think it is about the characters that people that are really resonating with people? Um, I think maybe, maybe it's just that Ying is, I think maybe likable. Like I think Ying, cause she's quite positive and she's no nonsense and she's gets on with things and doesn't whinge. Um, all the things that I'm not, she, you know, people really, um, Maybe that's it. They want her. They want her to have a win. Um, maybe for better or worse, they feel a bit sorry for Laya. I'm not sure. Um, and Miriam. It's interesting. Lots of people actually like Miriam. People. A lot of people tell me Miriam's the one that interests them the most, which I find interesting. Um, I really liked Miriam. Is that interesting? Yeah, yeah I, I find that really interesting. Um, but I guess. Yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad people like the characters because I like them too. Yeah. It's um, it's a fantastic feat, and there, um, Cass is holding up the book. So, um, definitely, um, I think that everyone should get their hands on this one, um, and definitely look back on the Fish Girl as well, which is really fantastic too. Um, I think um, we thank you, Mirandi, for joining us, thank and it's you. wonderful to get this big insight into the different kind of um, authors that have come out of Brisbane and what they're working on and the fact that, you know, everyone talks about Sydney and Melbourne, but I reckon we are the place yeah. to be. Yeah, we're pretty this up there. the place to be. Place to be. <laughs> it is. So um, speaking of um, Australian writing, um, just for the last little bit, I thought we'd hand over to Cass. And Cass, you normally tell us about what you've been reading. So what have you been reading, Cass? Yes. Well, I have a huge stack to talk, talk to you about tonight. Um, the first one I want to mention is, of course, the Miles Franklin award-winning novel, uh, The Yield by Tara June Winch. Lots of cheers from Chrissy there. Um, now, I just love this book. Uh, it weaves together three narratives to explore Aboriginal language, culture and society. Albert Gundawindi, the main character, is writing a dictionary of Indigenous words, which is, is and, and um, Tara June has actually written the dictionary into the book and it's, it's, it sounds um, dense and difficult, but it's actually beautifully um, done and very literary and a joy to read. Uh, the other character is his granddaughter, August, who's absolutely grief-stricken by his death and has come home to Australia for his funeral, where she rediscovers her connection to country. And the third narrative in the story is a mission-founding reverend who speaks to us through letters from 1915, which is as unusual as it sounds, um, but really adds a special dimension to the book. It's complex, moving, tender, and a really powerful celebration of a culture dispossessed and how identity and storytelling might be reclaimed. So I would highly recommend this book if you haven't um, already read it. The second book I wanted to recommend was The Bass Rock by Evie Wilde. Now you might remember Evie Wilde won the Miles Franklin as well with her first book, All the Birds Singing. Um, this is once again a stunning, literary, multi-generational narrative about the lives of three women constricted by male violence, power and control. It's very skillfully crafted, beautiful lyrical prose. It's unsettling, it's bleak and it's extraordinarily compelling. So it's one of those books that is, is bleak and yet you can't stop reading it. It's very well done. 
James Bradley's book, Ghost Species, um, which has just come out not too long ago. I am calling this a literary Jurassic Park. It's an ethical morass of a chaotic and a disintegrating world. It's about a scientific experiment with heartbreaking consequences. It's a tale of trauma, both personal and global, and it's a prescient window into a frightening future. Beautifully written, um, James Bradley is a, a very thoughtful, careful, scientific um, thinker and writer, uh, and this is carefully constructed, and it will really make you question our existence and purpose and, um, you know, what happens when we decide to start meddling with, with, um, with things such as, you know, reintroducing the thylacine or reintroducing the woolly mammoth or, in fact, reintroducing the Neanderthal people. Um, what happens if that all goes wrong? So that's a really interesting read. Uh, two more. This is for the crime lovers out there, A Good Turn by Derville McTiernan. Uh, Derville has just completely taken Australia by its storm with her novels um, The Ruin, The Scholar, and now this is the third in the series, The Good Turn. Um, it's an Irish series and it features Detective Cormac Riley, who is once again embroiled in personal and professional difficulties. Um, what Derville does really well, I think, is that she each book she concentrates on a different character. So although Cormac is in all of the books as the detective, um, this book, for example, um, focuses on the story of another Garda or detective um, in Ireland and a young woman and her daughter who refuses to speak. But it's got, again, police corruption, authentic characters that we really care about. It's a fast-paced book. Um, and I think if you've read any of her others, you will definitely love this one. And last but not least, I just wanted to quickly mention Sweetness and Light, which is by Liam Piper, which I thought was an absolutely remarkable study in characterization. It explores the darkest sides of human nature and the shades of gray in all of us and has a quite an explosive revelation at the end that, that actually really shocked me. It was a real surprise to me, the ending in this book. Um, there's, this is, it's really interesting the way he structured this too. So we're introduced to one character for, for quite, the first part of the book and then we're introduced to a second character and we know of course that these two characters are going to come together in the third part of the book which they do um, but it is certainly not predictable in any sense other, other than that um, everything that happens is really makes you think so Fantastic. Sweetness and Light by Liam Piper. Excellent and also a shout out to Tara June Winch, the winner of the Miles Franklin Literary Award, of course, is our Brizzy Girl. So Brisbane, yet again, winning the Miles Franklin. <laughs> we win. Two years <laughs> yet again, we are proving. We win again. Melissa Lukashenko. So come at us, Sydney, Melbourne, come at us, Western Australia, South Australia. <laughs> come, and, come and tell us your comments in the comment bar. Okay. <laughs> Have we got any comments before we head out? Are there any questions for um, Mirandi? Yep, we have a question from Mirandi from um, Laura, who asks, when do you think you first had the spark about um, Stone Sky Gold Mountain? What was the spark and what was that like? Ah, the spark would have been, because um, I was writing about a Chinese or Eurasian character in London, Victorian London. And I do remember, I wanted... Um, I wanted to write something set in Australia for Australian audience, I guess. And, and I thought, and I started to think about, well, what about the earliest Chinese here? And, and the gold rush, gold rush people weren't the, the earliest here. There were earlier Chinese. Um, so that's what, and, and I remember I read um, Ariella Van Loon's book, uh, Treading Air, I think. And I really liked its tone and I really, I wanted to write, I guess, an Australian novel like that, but um, coming from my own background, I guess, and point of view and what I could bring to it and what I could bring to it maybe that hadn't been brought to that sort of Australian novel necessarily. Yeah. So that's, thank you, Laura. Thank you. Um, yes, we have another couple of questions from Bianca. Um, Bianca says, um, 
Mirandi, how did you ensure dialogue was accurate for the time period? Um, and were there any big changes to how the historical aspects of the novel were presented in the editorial stage? Okay. Um, I've already forgotten the second question. I'll go with the first, the dialogue. Um, Bianca, it's something I kind of realised just from my own research and what I read about historical fiction and neo-Victorian fiction and that you had to, um, it had to also be appealing to a, to a sort of contemporary audience is uh, to not make it sort of like Victoriana, not to, you know, you're not replicating, I'm not replicating something from the time. So I guess then there's, there's authors like Sarah Waters who, um, you know, it's still, it, it's not jarring, it's still, it can almost be contemporary. And another, I remember another historical fiction writer said, all you really need are a couple of words that just sort of, um, you know, like centre you where you need to be, like in what period, and that's all you need, not to bung it on too much. I know with um, Stone Sky, I used a bit of Irish and Scottish um, accents, which I wouldn't normally do, but I did that just to show that they were as new to Australia as the Chinese were. Um, so that was sort of on purpose. But apart from that, it's a tiny, probably a tiny bit, bit more formal. You've got to make sure you're not using slang words that weren't used back then. Um, but apart from that, I try not to belabor it too much. Like I don't want it to be, you know, Victoriana replicating kind of um, language. I think that's what works uh, not to sort of, you know, not too flowery, not too, I mean, if people want to read um, work that's really centered in that period, they're going to read the writers of that period. You know? So I think there's, um, so anyway, that's how I try to work. I can't remember the second question, sorry. Uh, the second one was, um, were there any big changes to how the historical aspects of the novel were presented in the editorial stage? Any big changes, no. Not, no, no, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say so at all, no. Okay, no. lovely. I think I, I think I added a bit, but that was just for plot, um, but nothing to do with, no. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Um, those are the questions that we've had come through. So I might hand back to um, the three of you for any final questions. Uh, comments or questions that you had to, to I, ask yourselves? I just wanted to acknowledge that even though I have been bringing the fight to the southern states that um, I'm aware that Melbourne is in lockdown again and mm -hmm. um, I am um, totally feeling for you guys if you're watching from Melbourne you know we might bring the literary fight but um, don't worry it's going to be us in lockdown in a matter of weeks as well so I am not I, I really do feel for people who have had to go back into lockdown and all I can hope is that the writers that are in lockdown down there find some kind of solace in their work this time around. I know it's been really difficult for people to write during the pandemic and um, I hope that this time around um, you can actually get your teeth into a project because that would be the only good thing to come out of a second lockdown. Mm -hmm. Well said, Chrissy. And I just, sorry, go on, Randy. No, I was just saying well said, Chrissy. Yeah. yeah. All our and love. I yeah, all our love to Melbourne people. We, yeah, we do feel for Melbourne people. Um, but, but thank you everybody for joining us on the Brisbane Literary Mafia Zoomcast, which is all about celebrating Brisbane writers and writing, um, such as the fabulous Mirandi, who we've had with us tonight. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight, Mirandi. Thank you and for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. And once again, thank um, congratulations to Chrissy on winning her fellowship, which is, you know, I'm Yay. sure any writers who are who are watching that is like kind of the dream to win something like that. So we'll be expecting big things from that oh, book. No pressure. pressure. No pressure. <laughs> yeah. Got it right now. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Cass. And thanks, Emma Kate. Um, I think that we are um, good to go now. So I don't know, do we open up for a clap from the audience? Yeah, let's do that. I think we yeah. should tonight, yeah.
Yeah. So if um, I think we're allowing you to unmute yourselves and we're just going to go out with a clap um, for Mirandi. So thank you, Mirandi, for joining us. Oh, no. Clap Mirandi for Chrissy. And Chrissy. Clap for Chrissy. Mirandi and Chrissy. Yay, Chrissy. Yay. Welcome. Well done, Chrissy. Thanks for joining Hi, us, everybody. Thanks, Love everybody. Your faces. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.